afternoon. Welcome. My name is Patrick Callas. I work in the FAO um, Office of Climate, Biodiversity and Environment. I'm a technical officer and I'm also task force member of the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. And I'm very pleased and honored to shepherd us through this afternoon where we have two key objectives. One is about learning and exploring. We will learn about what the uh, globally important agricultural heritage systems are, what their potential is, and we will explore synergies. Synergies with the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration, which has been recently launched and will, will go on until 2030. So with these two larger objectives, we are in a virtual space and we will do our level best to make this as smooth as possible. But I will ask you for your patience in case there are any technical difficulties because we are truly having a global conversation today with colleagues joining from different time zones and different continents. So before we start, a few technical considerations, please, if I may. Number one, the seminar or the webinar will be conducted entirely in English with French and Spanish interpretation possibilities. To switch into your preferred language, you can click on the little globe uh, that says interpretation at the bottom of your screen to select your preferred language. Number two, we will ask you to kindly mute, mute, your, uh, mute your microphones. This will uh, increase the, the transition speed and smoothness. Uh, thirdly, this is designed to be an interactive conversation. However, it needs to be structured because we have uh, over 400 participants that have expressed interest. And currently we already have over 200 people joining. So please, if you have a question or a comment, put that into the Q and A uh, part that is at the bottom of the screen. Do not use the chat function, which we are using for internal communication purposes. So please use the Q&A at the bottom to make your points or have any questions on what you hear. Uh, lastly, all presentations will be uploaded to the GS website and the report will be written as a, a result of today's conversation. So even if we don't get to cover all of it, including answering all of your questions, we will make every effort to come back to you with clarifications in the follow-up to this event. Yeah, so with that, um, we welcome you again to this conversation. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the Deputy Director of the Office of Climate, Biodiversity and Environment, Mr. Zituni Udada to give us his opening remarks on behalf of FAO. Uh, Mr. Zituni, if I may give you the floor, over to you, please. Thank you. Well, thank you, Patrick, and welcome everyone to, to this webinar uh, from wherever you're joining. We very much appreciate the time you've taken to, to join us for this webinar. Um, and it's great pleasure for me to, to give this introduction, to, to set the scene to welcome everyone uh, and to highlight the importance of, of the theme that we're addressing today. Uh, I understand this is the first webinar that we're organizing within you know, the overall framework of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which is starting this year. Uh, and this is really an opportunity for us to explore how the GIS program uh, and its relevance to, to this UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And we will be hearing uh, directly uh, from colleagues who have experiences on the ground and who are representatives of these GIS sites from around the world. Um, so as um, you said, Patrick, this is really learning experience. We're learning and exploring. Uh, and it's important that you highlighted the synergies in what we're trying to do as well. There are so many actions that obviously we need to take you know, around climate change around biodiversity, around protecting nature and, and restoring ecosystems. But these have to be obviously 
done in synergistic way so they can deliver benefits to to people and and, and the planet and and be more effective and more coordinated um so i would like to to welcome all the participants as well and thank you for joining us and, and sharing your experiences with us uh, you all know that the, the one decade on ecosystem restoration will start this year until 2030 and um it is widely recognized that you know the, the the objectives particularly within the 2030 agenda for sustainable development that include objectives to end the poverty and uh, protect biodiversity combat climate change um, improve livelihood for everyone etc um, these obviously depend on how much we care about ecosystems and nature uh, so unless we really deal with the ecosystem degradation that is ongoing and restore ecosystems that at, at a really global and large scale, then we are not going to be able to meet these very critical objectives about hunger, poverty, and, and combating climate change and, and biodiversity. So this is why in, in, in this context, uh, I'm very pleased to say that um, FAO is taking advantage of this opportunity of the UN, UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, um, you know, to, to look at the, the transformation of, of, of food systems that, that we need to address, uh, food, fiber, and feed production systems in, in general, particularly for, for, for this century, because they are absolutely critical in the objectives I highlighted earlier to eradicate poverty, hunger, and mal malnutrition. Um, and this is through the effective and innovative landscapes and, and, and seascape management that we need to, to make sure we address because that's where we obtain our food from. And the GIS are, are, are absolutely um, critical in, in, in this endeavor because um, they are formed as a result of what farmers do in terms of their interventions on the field uh, to, protect, to protect nature and an ecosystem, then this is done from generation to generation. Uh, and it is done to, to overcome so many difficulties that the farmers face in, in the field in everyday um, life, uh, to increase the yield, to improve the resource use efficiency, uh, and also to use really the, the, the wisdom and traditional knowledge. And these are all critical into maintaining these GI sites and, and restoring um, the, the ecosystems that they depend on. And, and there is really such a wide variety of these GIS sites and, and their own ecosystems in, in the world. And, and we know that there are, for example, rice terraces in, in Asia, uh, oasis agriculture in North Africa, the agroforestry and pastoralism in, in Africa as well. Um, there are um, Andean agriculture in South America and also the Mediterranean agriculture in, in Europe, etc. And all these um, sites, they, they demonstrate really how we are managing, managing them and, and developing them to, to conserve, you know, through, through human activities all, all through the, the times. And this can help us, of course, learn from each other about well, how this ecosystem restoration is done um, through the analysis of, of these ecosystems, the observations, and also their conservation and, and the restoration practices that are applied in these different parts of the world that, that I mentioned. And I really hope that um, at this webinar today, We'll be learning from these experiences from around the world, and we'll be learning from each each other about these practices and how they apply in in various contexts, uh, and what do they require actually to restore and prevent the degradation of ecosystem. As I said earlier, really what we want is is to have this done at scale, given the the challenges that we are facing. So this is why we are having this webinar today, and we invited. Um, experts from six GIS sites from, from I understand, from, from Japan, from China, um, Tanzania, Spain, and Morocco, and Peru, uh, who will uh, share with us their experiences and present 
their specific experiences and specific practices that they are having for the restoration of, of these ecosystems. So um, I really um, hope that this webinar will provide everyone who's joining us today with, with the learning experiences. I hope at the end of this webinar, you will go with something that you've learned about the importance of this site for ecosystem restoration and for the decade that is starting this year. And by learning about some, some new practices that hopefully you can apply in your own context and your own uh, country as well. Um, so I hope this is an introduction that sets the scene. Again, welcome everyone and thank you for taking the time to join us and I wish you all uh, a very fruitful webinar. Back to you, Patrick. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Udada, for these grounding words to reminding us of the sense of urgency about harmony between uh, people and planet, uh, reminding us of the ambition and the scale uh, that is needed to bring, bring about a transformation, putting food systems at the center of the debate, among many more thoughts. And thank you very much for this. And uh, our next opening speaker, I'm going to check whether Mr. Tim Christofferson is online. Um, we, will, we will check. Yes, he is online. Wonderful. Um, uh, the UN Decade is a, a larger partnership within the United Nations. And one of the key uh, driving forces is uh, our sister agency, the United Nations Environmental Program. And it's my pleasure to give the floor now to uh, Mr. Tim Christofferson. He's the head of the Nature Climate Branch Ecosystem Division at UNEP. And he would uh, enlighten us a bit more about what the decade of uh, ecosystem restoration is all about, what the background is, the objectives, and perhaps most importantly, what are some of the actions and expected outcomes. So with that, uh, Mr. Christopherson, the floor is yours. You're most welcome. Thank you very much, Patrick, and also to Yoshihide and, and Zituni and all the FAO colleagues and others on this webinar. Um, I would like to give a brief intro to the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration and then look forward to having most of the time, hopefully, for discussions uh, with all the practitioners and partners out there. Um, I will also share, of course, the presentation with you and hope that you can share with everybody on this webinar. Um, as well as what we call the steps to launch document for the UN decade. Um, and it is, as Patrick said, really a global, it's a collaborative effort, not only of the entire UN system led by FAO and UNA, but of everybody who we want to have on board. It's based on a unanimous UN General Assembly resolution from 2019 and the focus is on all ecosystems. So whether they pr it be production, agriculture, fisheries, forestry, um, both terrestrial and marine. We have five task forces of which two are already operational. Patrick, you mentioned one on um, best practices on monitoring. We will have one on finance, science and youth. The main approach of the decade though is to involve everybody and their work in what we call generation restoration. And I will come to that in one minute. So the objectives of the decade um, are based on the problem that without restoring ecosystems at a large scale, we cannot achieve the sustainable development goals. This goes for SDG 2, uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It's actually um, pretty much across all the SDGs. Uh, without a functioning and intact biosphere, we'll not be able to uh, achieve the future we want. The vision of the decade is a world where the relationship between humans and nature has been restored. So this is very important. It's not only about the numbers of hectares restored. It's about our relation as humans, our role in and with nature. The Secretary General called making peace with nature the defining task of the 21st century. It has to be the top, top priority for everybody everywhere. Those are not my words. That's what Antonio Guterres said on the 2nd of December. So this decade is about making peace with nature. It has three basic goals in our strategy, enhancing the existing global, regional, national, local commitments to prevent, halt, and reverse the degradation of ecosystems, increase our understanding of the multiple benefits of successful restoration, 
and apply this knowledge in relevant decision making. To do that, I will skip over the barriers. I'm sure everybody on this call is well versed with the barriers to the, the kind of work that you do. Um, but to do that, there are three pathways to reach it. First of all, we need a global movement that will shift the needle on political decisions. Decisions of ministers of finance, of heads of states at the level and urgency that we see now for COVID, uh, of course, also linked then to the economic recovery. So we need a global movement to build the, the political will, and then we need to be ready. And here is where you come in, not only FAO, but everybody on this call with the technical capacity, how to do this and where. This is a 10 point summary of the strategy, which is a 40 page document. So I encourage all of you to read that, but if you don't have the time, here's 10 points. So we want to empower global movement, finance restoration on the ground, set the right incentives, celebrate leadership, shift behaviors, including on diets, invest in research, build up capacity, celebrate a culture of restoration, build up the next generation and listen and learn. The most important word in what I just said is we. So what does we mean? We doesn't mean Zituni and Patrick and myself as the FAO and UNEP team. Uh, we means all of us, all of you on this call, all of your organizations, all of your families, all of your communities, all of the cities where you live, that's we. So, of course, we don't do this in a vacuum. A lot has been done. What we can hopefully think about on this webinar, and I'm coming to the end uh, now, is what is the role of your network and the sites that you have in inspiring more restoration and more regenerative agriculture in particular in this context? because the role of agriculture and food systems is of course central to what we discussed. This is not only about more protected areas, not only about uh, restoring uh, non-productive lands, it's about productive ecosystems and how to make them more um, ecologically, socially and economically viable. Again, I will skip this. There's the task force on good practice, the monitoring task force, both led by FAO but you can see this in the slides when they are shared. Uh, what I would like to spend my last uh, few seconds on until my time is up is the visual identity of the decade, which you can download and use and even adapt to your own organization's visual identity. And you're already free to use this. This is available on the decade website in the six UN languages and soon in more languages. So you are already encouraged to use these social media assets. They're all online. Um, you're already encouraged to become part of the uh, generation restoration. Th this steps to launch document is also something that I hope you can share after this call. Uh, if you have any questions, here are our two email addresses in the FAO and uh, UNEP teams. Um, so please do let us know. Uh, and join Generation Restoration. Thank you. Tim, brilliant. Thank you so very much uh, for your uh, spot on and inspiring uh, call for uh, joint action. Yes, it's about the we, it's not a UN effort. Making peace with nature, absolutely. Uh, a global movement in which all of us are part, no matter what role we can play. And uh, really making the link already to, to GIAS in a way of trying to inspire restoration and the key word being regenerative agriculture that conserves but also sustainably uses biodiversity in ways uh, that can further the, the sustainable development goals. So thank you very much for that. Uh, generation restoration, the presentation will be shared with everybody and without further ado, let's uh, look at the other side of the coin of today's discussion, which is GIAS uh, itself. And to enlighten us and open up the GIAS box, so to speak, I'm very pleased to invite uh, the, the coordinator, the GIAS coordinator uh, at FAO to give us an overview, uh, Mr. Yoshida Endo, who will also try to explore the relevance to the to ecosystem restoration. So Mr. Endo, uh, the floor is yours for your presentation. You're most welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalas. 
thank you very much for all the participants and uh, all the people who were involved in the preparation of this uh, webinar. My name is Yoshida Endo. I'm a jazz coordinator in FAO. I, today, I'm going to make a presentation on the JESS program very briefly. I have just five minutes. And the relevance of JESS program, JESS activity to the ecosystem restorations. OK, let me have some minutes to make a connection with my PowerPoint. I hope it is well connected now. Yes, then let me start. Yes, we can see, we can see it. Let me start. Okay. And I, I, I must be from explaining the GS abbreviation. GS is abbreviation of the globally important agriculture heritage systems. Now the definition of the GS is a bit complicated as you can see in the screen, but it can be expressed briefly in such a way that the GS is a remarkable land use systems and landscapes with valuable biodiversity and harmonization between environment and development, as you can see in the underlined parts of the definition. Now, let me explain about the GS operational framework here. The designation process starts from proposal making by member countries, then the proposal document is finally evaluated by the expert group called Scientific Advisor Group, SAG. After the designation, the responsibility of management of GS sites return to the GS sites and their stakeholders. GS sites are recommended to implement action plan for dynamic conservation. It can be easily deduced that the GS sites have been created as a result of farmers' efforts for many years to overcome difficulties they faced and to improve their production. Now, let me explain uh, GS and ecosystem relation. From this consideration, we can observe that farmers in GS site have established the agriculture system which use ecosystem service effectively. GS site itself can be recognized as agriculture ecosystems developed by human interaction with the nature. Farmers in GS site have been carrying out good agriculture practices to avoid severe degradation of the environment and promote agrobiodiversity. Then let me introduce several examples of GS sites in the world very quickly. Now we have 60 GS sites in 22 countries in the world. This is agroforestry system in the Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. This is a human-made agroforestry system where several types of trees and shrubs are ecologically supporting each other. The maintenance of this system is influenced by social and economic conditions of local farmers. This is Maasai pastoral system in Tanzania and Kenya. Ecological functions of grassland play critical important roles for the lives of the Maasai people. This is honey rice terrace in China, whose features are not only magnificent landscape, but also many local rice varieties and excellent irrigation system using ecological function of the natural forest. This is Chinampa in Mexico. This is artificially formed farmland, which dates back to Azteca time, and farmers are still using surrounding ecological services. This is Japanese geosite site in South Island, where farmers restored all the practices to enable rice production to coexist with the lives of the natural world. This is Andean agriculture. Uh, in Peru, where local species of crops and animals are grown with terraces and unique water management constructs. Now, after all this consideration, I can introduce the following provisional observations. Number one, farmers in GIA site have developed unique agriculture systems which provide specific services 
as farmers have designed. Number two, farmers have good agriculture practices to avoid degradation of soils and water, to maintain agrobiodiversity, and to achieve harmonization with the environment. Number three, given that farmers are custodians of agriculture resources and resource management, ecosystem restoration in just like has close linkage with economic conditions, cultural identity, local organizations, and traditional knowledge of the farmers. And number four, more information, more analysis in terms in the perspective of scientific, social, and economic uh, perspectives are necessary for the future consideration of GS and ecosystem restoration. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Mr. Endo, for the timely uh, presentation and really illustrating to us not only of the potential of GS, but the beauty with some of the striking images that, we, that we've seen. Uh, it's dynamic conservation uh, I've picked up, uh, which is really the nexus between the environment and sustainable development, but also putting the farmer and producers at the center as custodians. And this should frame our, our understanding as well, who actually uh, should be enabled and empowered most uh, to achieve some of the UN decades ob objectives. And I'm sure we'll speak about this a bit more in the um, final session. So um, we will now embrace ourselves on a journey across the world of six countries. Uh, because for time reasons, Mr. Endo was only able to scratch the surface of what GS is. And so will our uh, next six participants. And this is for time reasons. But as I said, much more deeper information will be available following the webinar and also in the report. Uh, but it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce our next speaker and we're traveling to Japan. Uh, meanwhile, one point of order, uh, thank you for those who have already put in questions and observations into the Q and uh, chat box. Please uh, continue doing that. Uh, because we will hear now six presentations, each seven minutes of length, and we will have a discussion at the end. But as you're thinking and as you're listening to the presentations, please share with us your thoughts, questions, and observations, uh, and we will, we will uh, collectively look at those uh, throughout. All right, without further ado, it's my pleasure now to give the floor to uh, Dr. Naito who is Associate Professor of the Graduate School of Technology, Industrial and Social Sciences at Tokushima University. He's also a member of several Japanese academic societies, and he will focus his presentation on the ecological functions uh, associated with the use of semi-natural grasslands, uh, illustrating this with two Japanese geosites. Dr. Naito, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. You have seven minutes, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me share my PowerPoint first. OK, I think it's functioning properly. Thank you very much. Today, uh, I'm not going to talk about this Mount Fuji, but talk about the importance of semi-natural grasslands just an ordinary, nothing special kind of landscape in Japan. The title of my presentation is Restoration of Semi-Natural Grassland in Japan from the case of Shizuoka and Tokushima just site. Semi-natural grasslands are kind of second nature. They are not uh, intensely cultivated or fertilized and mainly with spontaneously established flora. They are human nature hybrid environment, not pure nature. However, semi-natural grasslands are one of the most species-rich ecosystem in the world. Today, I'm going to introduce two semi-natural grasslands in relate with just sites of Japan. Those grasslands are dominated by Miscarus sinensis, this uh, species. One, one is Chaksaba at Shizuoka tea site, the other is Kayaba at Tokushima mountain site. In 1880s, 
80% of our land was grassland, but decreased up to 1% only now. This brings severe biocultural diversity crisis. Harvested grass seeds are dried, cut, and spread on the furrows of tea field in Shizuoka traditional tea grass integrated system, for example. This improves soil environment and tea quality. This kind of semi natural grass seeds have important role in another just sites. That is Tokushima uh, Nishiawa steep slope land agriculture system, uh, this one. The process of Chakusaba or Kayaba farming method, farmers traditionally maintain semi-natural grassland, harvest them in autumn, and dry grasses in winter, cut and spread in crop field, finally. These farming methods bring a lot of good effect, improvement of soil physical condition and weed control, prevention of soil erosion, improve improvement of taste of tea also. From here, I would like to compare the variety of vegetation at Chaksaba Kaiba grassland. In Kakegawa Shizuoka tea site, the area of tea field is 182.4 hectare. At the same time, the area of grassland is 129.6 hectare. There is some variety of grassland like those photo. I would like to classify vegetation types of 50 Chaksaba grassland using twin span. Group one and two are semi-natural grassland, others are natural grassland. Group one and two, which is semi-natural grassland show a greater number of plant species and higher Shannon diversity index than any other vegetation type. On the other hand, in Tokushima mountain site, because of depopulation, farmlands are abandoned. However, people start to reuse abandoned farmland as Kayaba grassland again. This is a result of vegetation classification of 190 Kayaba grassland Group one and two show a greater number of plant species and higher Shannon diversity index. Why group one and two are rich in plant species? According to CCA analysis, the high biodiversity Kayaba grasslands are not affected by deer feeding and damage, deer feeding damage and fertilizers. Finally, I would like to introduce some effort to maintain and restore semi-natural grassland. In Shizuoka, promotion of biodiversity related production makes sense. Especially authentication of Chagsaba farming products seems to work as an incentive to maintain and restore Chagsaba semi-natural grassland. To maintain and restore semi-natural grassland, grassroots level voluntary association is also important. In Tokushima Mountain site, Higashi Ia Millet Production Cooperative was organized in 2016 by local citizens. They reclaimed abandoned farmland as Kayaba semi-natural grassland again, and started small scale but commercial millet production. I would like to summarize my presentation. Semi-natural grasslands are one of the most species-rich ecosystems in the world. It is also important to restore this kind of human nature hybrid environment. In Shizuoka and Tokushima just site, utilizing semi-natural grassland is the key to conserve biodiversity. Chaksaba or Kayaba semi-natural grassland a good example of biodiversity conservation by traditional resource use. Biodiversity of well-managed semi-natural grassland is higher than natural grassland. The using abandoned farmland as semi-natural grassland is also effective to maintain biodiversity. To restore semi-natural grassland in Japan, 
agricultural promotion policy by using GEOS was effective to encourage farmers utilizing semi-natural grassland. At the same time, grassroots level voluntary association is also key to restore semi-natural grasslands. Thank you very much. Dr. Naito, Naito thank you so very much for your uh, timely, a uh, very timely uh, presentation. I know it is a challenge. Um, you've enlightened us and given us data and scientific rigor. This is very impressive and needed uh, as we uh, understand better what the potentials of some of these GIA sites are. But also as an ecological anthropologist, you've highlighted the importance of people and collective action um, and the cooperatives and how it is organized among others. And also the potential of regenerative agriculture um, among other things. So we will let it stand here and we will uh, travel now to China. Uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, Dr. Mu Sheng to enlighten us about uh, the GS site, GS and NIA sites and activities in China. Um, and uh, I should say that uh, he is, uh, Dr. Dr. Mu Sheng is a uh, agriculture professor uh, and he's, he's working at the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. He's an associated professor at the Institute of Geographic Sciences. Uh, and the floor is yours to help us understand uh, the potentials in China. Over to you, Professor. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your introduction. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you and uh, communicate with you through the internet. And uh, I will share our research on China's GS ecosystem services. In, two, in June 2005, the Qingtian rice fish culture system in China was designated as one of the first five GS pilot sites in the world. And in 2012, China NIAS, the last no important agricultural heritage system, was launched by the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Up to now, 118 China NIAS sites were designated by MARO, and 15 GIA sites were designated by FAO in China. The Qingtian rice fish culture system is the first GS in China. And the left picture show us the system can reduce some environmental pollution because of the material cycle between rice and fish. For example, rice plants can use nitrogen in fish feed that is not directly used by fish. And therefore the nitrogen fertilization can be reduced. And as shown in the table one, the density of weeds in rice fish system is lower than hybrid rice monoculture and reduce the chemical herbicide usage. And besides, the uh, feature two show us the rice fish has a significant decrease in the density of rice pests. We evaluated and compared the eco-services between rice fish system and hybrid rice model cropping. We calculated the values of oxygen production and the carbon dioxide uptake, nutrient conservation, water regulation, pest control, and the tourism. And the values of traditional system are higher than rice model cropping. And also there are some negative effects should be cut off, like methane emission, water pollution, and the food safety threat. So the light value of ecosystem eco services were gotten. The traditional system is about five times than the rice model cropping. And the Chongjiang Dong's rice fish stock system is located in the mountains of southwest China. Compared with the rice fish system, the land here is relatively barren. So 
In order to maintain soil fertility, farmers have introduced the ducks to the rice fish system. Uh, this is uh, traditional rice, uh, glutinous rice, and this is uh, hybrid rice. It can be seen from these four pictures that the rice fish stock, the rice fish stock system have better soil fertility maintenance function, including the organic matter, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and add. And also, the rice fish stock system can also effectively control weeds in the rice field as well as the uh, Pests and the pests and the disease. Honey rice terraces system is both GS and the World Heritage. This system lasted for more than 1,300 years in the mountainous area. And in this system, there are low reservoirs, but the water supply is abundant. The reason is the forests on the top of the mountains are helpful in water conservation through interception, stream flow, and soil storage. In a field experiment, a small path was dug on the ground under trees. And after 40 minutes, and we can see that after two hours, the puddle was full of water, which successfully proved its high water retention. And the scientific data also proves that in this area, the soil moisture content of forest land is higher than that of uh, land forest land. Besides, a paper published in Nature shows that crop diversity is a possible solution to the disease control. The traditional glutinous and the hybrid mixture cultivation could increase yield by 89% and reduce rice blast, a kind of pest, by 94%. And the last case is traditional Chinese date gardens. This system is located on North Plateau and the soil erosion is very serious. From then on, the Yellow River turns yellow due to the increase of sediment. Jujube trees have a strong ability to extend roots in all directions. Thus, it can prevent soil erosion. It is a forest, forest, forest land, shrubland, grassland, and jujube garden in Jiaxian County. Picture A is the amount of soil loss, and the picture B is the converted soil conservation, conservation capacity which proves that the jujube has a more obvious effect on soil conservation in the Lord's Plateau. And this table shows the economic value of the jujube forest ecosystem services in Jiaxian County, including five functions. And for the Lord's Plateau functions, such as biodiversity protection, soil and water conservation, Wind break and the sand fixation are particularly important. That all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mosheng, for this illustration. Uh, symbiotic relationships between humans and nature is one of the words I've picked up. Also, the impressive numbers in terms of soil fertility and disease control, but also the economic viability of these systems. It's a dimension we should not underestimate and something we need to dive into certainly a bit further. So now, um, traveling from China, we will uh, shift continents and we will travel to Africa virtually to tap into the wisdom of uh, Mr. Firmat Banzi from Tanzania. Mr. Banzi is now retired. But he was a principal agriculture officer in the land use planning division of the Ministry of Agriculture in Tanzania. And he will illustrate uh, the case for Chaga Home Gardens of agroforestry systems and other considerations. And uh, Mr. Banzi, may I invite you to take the floor, please, sir. Over to you. 
Good morning, everybody. Good, good afternoon, sorry. Good afternoon. We can uh, hear you loud and clearly. Over to you. Okay. Okay, now let me load my presentation. I see Mr. Banzi uh, not yet seeing the presentation. Not yet see? Not yet. We don't see the presentation yet, unfortunately. Ah, uh, okay. Let's see. If you if you hit your share the screen button, uh, perhaps that will help. Would you like to try that? Th this one? Share share your screen. Yes, let's see. Ah, uh, okay. And, and here. So. Uh, Otherwise, as an alternative, if I may suggest, uh, for the sake yes. of time. Yes. Um, could somebody, yeah. perhaps Mr. Endo, uh, uh, share his screen with your presentation and you could kindly indicate uh, to move the slides. Would that be agreeable? Okay, I try. Yes, just a moment. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Endo. And thank you everybody for the patience. Okay, let's see. If it wouldn't work, uh, um, you would just have to tell us a beautiful story, uh, Mr. Bunzi. Uh -huh. And we would have to close our yeah. eyes and we would have to be trans, <laughs> trans, transformed into your... Here we go. Here we go. Mr. Endo is sharing the screen. Uh, can, can you see? I open the screen right now. So, Mr. Bunzi, please instruct I, me. Okay. Yes, okay. over to you. Wonderful. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, as you said, I'm a retired officer from the Ministry of Agriculture. And uh, during my service, I coordinated the uh, Chaga Home Garden project, GIS project. Okay, let's go. Next. Yes, my presentation will have the, uh, the yeah, the following. Beck, please. Yeah, I'll present something on uh, the Chaga Home Garden GIS site, uh, ecosystems in the Chaga Home Gardens, cultural uh, aspects, uh, conservation and restoration activities, challenges and conclusion. Next, please. Yes, the agroforest system is located on the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro and it's practiced mainly by the Chaga ethnic tribe and the, the system covers about one, uh, 120,000 he hectares and uh, the altitude range between 1500 to 1900 and the climate I can say it's the Montana a forest with rainfall ranging from 1200 to 2000. Next, please. Uh, this is a map of the location. It's northern Tanzania and the, around the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. You will see more details on the, 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 the uh, text. Next, please. Uh, in the, the ecosystem, the Chaga Home Gardens, there are about uh, five uh, ecosystems that make it uh, our contribute to resilience. We have the agroforest land use, agrobiodiversity, traditional irrigation, organic farming, and carbon sink. Next. Uh, for the agroforest land use, the system uh, is a uh, 
is the anagrow forest composed of three uh, main uh, components, the tree, the crops, and the livestock, which benefits from each other. And the unique feature for the agroforestry landscape is the uh, multi-layered vegetation structure. There are about four uh, vegetation layers. The uppermost is the trees, then next is the banana, and it is the coffee, and below coffee, there are uh, vegetables. Uh, livestock consists mainly uh, dairy, cattle, sheep, goats, and some pigs and some uh, livestock, all of them are just kept indoors. And they are fed, they are cut grasses and fed. Yeah, this is the, how the system looks from a, a little distance. You have the trees, the banana, but if we go closer, you see coffee and vegetables underneath. Next. The other ecosystems are agrobiodiversity. Uh, from the, uh, the baseline survey, we have noted that for the site, uh, uh, for the site itself, about 18 domesticated animals types, about eight crop uh, trees and shrubs varieties. Uh, so it has a lot of diversity. And the farmers maintain these species, some of them are quite natural for a long time because of their use value, let's say for medicinal, uh, treating uh, some diseases and even in pest control in the field. And the various crop species have been also kept through selection with time. So the system has a very, uh, is very rich in a, a gene bank, which can also be used for, for research. Next. Uh, the, uh, the ecosystem three is the traditional irrigation system. For, for these uh, home gardens, they are, they are supplementary irrigated by uh, uh, furrows with waters taped from the canals up the forest. They are, has been designed traditionally and they, even in the plots or the home gardens, they are also uh, connected with furrows and the uh, small dams called the uh, endeavors, which store water, especially during the dry season, during the night and they, they, they open up and they irrigate the feeds during the day. Next. The other ecosystem is organic farming. Uh, for this, what I can say that from the system when it started, it was uh, basically or, or organic. It, it, there was no use of pesticides or whatever. But in the 18th century, when the coffee was brought, then it was also brought with some use of uh, pesticides and some fertilizer. Now that with time became uh, more costly for the farmers, especially with some uh, uh, drop in the coffee price during the early 2000s. And farmers, some of the farmers decided to abandon the home gardens or change them for other uh, crops. But if the, uh, the, if the project uh, uh, set with the, the community and the, they agreed to, to go back to organic farming, they were introduced to some experts and now they produce the coffee, or, uh, organic coffee. And they were also linked with the, the uh, organic coffee institution, institutions. Next. Uh, the other ecosystem, we can say the carbon sink. Uh, studies which have been done on uh, above ground organic carbon and soil organic carbon has have shown that both above ground carbon and soil organic carbon were higher in the Chaga home gardens compared to the lowlands, which are mainly uh, under annual crops. So the study also cited that high biomass and the indigenous uh, management 
as a possible uh, reason that uh, contribute to high organic carbon. Yes. And vegetation, we know that is one of uh, uh, many factors. Yeah. The, the cultural, yes, let's go next. The cultural aspect relevant to the ecosystem. Uh, this is system, uh, the chaga, no need to hold uh, on some of these cultural norms, values, and ceremonies for so long time and even up to now, they still hold them. Uh, like uh, the, the land, the, the, the home garden is allocated to or passed to children. And uh, the children are also taught to do some chores related to the home gardens as long as, as, as soon as they start working and those chores continues with, uh, with their age. Uh, so the chaga, they, they, in that way they pass the knowledge and the experience, the practices from one generation to another. And even today, still the traditional uh, staple food still are, are maintained, banana, maize, and the other menus related to the system are still maintained. So they have a very strong a cultural uh, 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 system. Next. 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 Our conservation and restoration activities of the ecosystems. This is uh, both in terms of crop management, soil conservation and the nutrient cycling. For the crop management, they are, it is related to the way the crops uh, are arranged in the, the field, as well as the practices like uh, pruning and even opening the canopy at a, 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 an appropriate time to allow for, uh, for other uh, like uh, coffee flowering. Soil management, there's multi-cropping practices with the uh, maximum soil cover and mulching like that, and the, even also adding some uh, manuring from the livestock. And in terms of nutrient cycling, you see they use the crop residues and fed it to livestock. And from the livestock, they use the manure and put back to the home gardens. In that way, they maintain a, a nutrient a cycling. Next. Next. Challenges. Uh, there are several challenges, but maybe some of them were related to the market of the organic coffee is still unstable. Also, there's a need for more diversification of the agricultural production, like introducing introduction of let's say fish farming in the, the ponds. Uh, there are also need for increased stakeholder participation in the, the coffee value chain, like processing industries to make the, uh, uh, the market for coffee stable. And also a need for cultural tourism. This has been easy, it's being practiced at a very low scale, but it needs further uh, development. Next. So in conclusion, we check the Chaga Home Garden stands out as the most intact example of upland agroforest system in Tanzania. It is uh, over 500 years old. This system is supported by this ecosystem, as I, I, I mentioned, and uh, therefore the system continues to demonstrate how it can strike social, environmental, and the uh, balance in it's a frag this fragile environment. So, yes, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bundy, uh, ah. Mr. Bunzi, to yes. to having brought us to Tanzania. Uh, two points I picked up among many others. Um, 
the relevance of culture and the generational element of it, um, not to be underestimated because culture is, is about people and, and this is something we may wish to tap into. And the link to climate change and looking also below the ground with its potential for uh, so soil uh, carbon capture, etc. A tremendous potential there uh, as scientists tell us to address the challenge of climate change. So with that, thank you very much. And we are moving swiftly um, to uh, Morocco now. And we don't mean to rush, we are a little bit behind, uh, but we, we wanna get through these presentations um, uh, now. So to Morocco, it's a pleasure to give the floor to Professor Mohamed Bahri. Um, he's a director of strategic partnership at the National Agency for the Development of Oasis and Argon Tree Areas. And he will enlighten us about the, some of the Moroccan Aegea sites. <coughs> Professor Bakri, over to you. You have seven minutes, sir. You're most welcome. Merci beaucoup. Merci de nous avoir convié à ce webinar très important. Je remercie également la FAO et le secrétariat chargé des CIPAM. J'ai le grand plaisir de vous présenter les CIPAM Maroc et la restauration des écosystèmes. Donc, mon exposé s'articule autour de trois, deux, deux points plutôt avec une conclusion. Premier point, je vais essayer d'approcher un peu le rôle des CIPAM dans les services écosystémiques. Et deuxième point concerne les activités de, dans ces CIPAM qui assurent la conservation et la restauration des écosystèmes. Et enfin, j'essaierai de répondre un petit peu euh, à la fin de, sur le rôle des CIPAM dans euh, l'approche globale du développement et des restaurations des écosystèmes. Au Maroc, nous avons euh, jusqu'à maintenant deux euh, euh, CIPAM qui ont été euh, désignés en, en 2011 et en 2018. Nous avons un troisième qui, dont le dossier est déjà au cours d'examen de, par le comité scientifique, c'est celui de Figui. Et nous avons deux autres potentiels qui ont un fort potentiel qui pourraient, être, qui pourraient faire l'objet d'une proposition très prochainement. Deux remarques, c'est que ces, ces six PAM sont situés dans une la zone ici au centre du Maroc qui est euh, reconnue par sa fragilité et c'est la zone d'action de notre agence. C'est une agence unique qui s'occupe de ces écosystèmes euh, fragilisés aussi bien par euh, les effets euh, anthropiques que par les effets des changements euh, climatiques. Euh, ces deux écosystèmes, ce, cette zone est constituée également par deux réserves de biosphère, à savoir la réserve des biosphères des oasis du sud du Maroc et la réserve des biosphères de l'Arganerie. Donc, comme premier point concernant les services écosystémiques, c'est le rôle qu'a les CIPAM dans l'approvisionnement. Ces CIPAM, ces, 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 ces périmètres, assurent la sécurité alimentaire avec une agriculture diversifiée et qui occupe une, la plus grande partie partie de la population dans ces zones-là à plus de 65%. Et il assure une production végétale avec 45 espèces cultivées sur 125 variétés. Il assure une production animale. Il assure une certaine disponibilité des ressources hydriques. Et également, il assure euh, beaucoup de, de plantes médicinales qui assure le, le médica, la médication locale. Et également, ces, ces PAM, ils permettent euh, de faire des habitations avec le bois et également assurer le chauffage avec du bois euh, dans ces zones. C'est l'autre service assuré par la CIPAM, c'est le, le, le service de régulation par la pollinisation, la production fruitière, l'ensemencement des parcours, la régulation également de l'eau, surtout dans ces zones-là, qui connaissent beaucoup de problèmes d'extrêmes, soit en excès, soit en rareté de l'eau. Et euh, bien sûr, il assure une certaine protection dans, euh, de ces zones-là, euh, de ces excès. Les CIPAM, comme il a été soulevé par ma, mes prédécesseurs, il assure également un certain héritage culturel très important, matériel et immatériel. Un héritage d'architecture, de culinaire, de chant et de danse et de poésie qui permet 
un, une, une, un sentiment d'appartenance de, de, de la population dans ces zones-là et donne une matrice de vie de communautaire dans ces zones-là. C'est également une richesse en matière de paysage qui permet un écotourisme et la création de circuits touristiques de ces, euh, dans ces zones-là. C'est euh, le deuxième point que je vais aborder concernant les activités de préservation des écosystèmes concerne tout d'abord la conservation des sols à travers d'un certain nombre d'actions. En premier lieu, les constructions de terrasses, donc vous voyez un peu les images ici sans rentrer un petit peu dans les détails, qui assurent la pratique de la culture, qui, qui assurent la conservation des sols et la récupération des eaux, mais aussi ils ont un rôle environnemental pour ralentir la vitesse de l'eau et éviter les problèmes d'érosion. Toujours dans le, la, la technologie liée à la préservation des sols, et les sols ils sont euh, bien préservés avec des rotations culturelles qui ont été adaptées et, et euh, appropriées par les utilisateurs. Ce sont des rotations euh, bien rodées en utilisant des céréales, des légumineuses, des jachères. Et donc, ce sont des techniques qui se sont bien incorporées avec le temps et qui sont très bénéfiques dans le maintien du sol. Nous avons aussi l'association des cultures avec différentes espèces maraîchères et céréaliers et parfois plusieurs étages du premier, deuxième et troisième degré. Donc, ça veut dire des plantes herbacées, des, des buissons et puis des grands arbres. Et au niveau de ces zones-là, pratiquement, l'apport la, euh, de, 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 de la chimie est absente et donc il y a de la fumure organique. Toujours dans la pratique, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire la restauration des sols Donc, il y a des ouvrages très importants qui sont soit faits par les, les agriculteurs et les bénéficiaires eux-mêmes, soit faits par des, maintenant des, 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 des ingénieurs et qui sont développés avec le temps. Construction d'un certain nombre d'ouvrages contre les, 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 les eaux, euh, plantation des, autour des berges d'un certain nombre d'arbres, construction des murs en gabion contre les crues et construction des ouvrages dont vous voyez les photos euh, sur place. Donc il y a aussi tout ce qui a été développé autour de, du facteur de l'eau qui est très important. Donc il y a des pratiques séculaires de la gestion de l'eau et qui sont euh, liées à la gestion en même temps de l'excès et à la gestion de la rareté. Il y a la gestion de la rareté par des ouvrages très, appréciés, très, très efficaces de surface, à savoir les matfeyas. Il y a des techniques très, très développées en matière de mobilisation des ressources souterraines qui sont les retara. Et je ne peux pas, dans ces petits, ce peu de temps, détailler l'ingéniosité qui est développé à travers le temps dans ces zones-là. Et bien sûr, il y a toute une technique de partage de l'eau entre les bénéficiaires qui sont très développés par les mesures de débit. Donc, pour, tout, pour faire tout ceci, il y a un système organisationnel qui s'est mis en place pour la gestion de l'eau, délégation, et pour la même chose, la gestion des parcours. Il faut juste signaler que ces pratiques sont des pratiques ancestrales, mais malheureusement, elles commencent à disparaître et qu'il faudrait récupérer et mettre dans des réglementations modernes. Donc, les plans qui ont été mis en place pour la sauvegarde et le développement de ces femmes, ils euh, approprient les actions qui sont déjà, euh, euh, je dirais, courantes et faites, et, mais ils ajoutent d'autres constructions, d'autres ouvrages qui résout des problèmes liés à la modernisation et la modernité. Il y a les constructions des barrages collinéaux, il y a la restauration des parcours, il y a l'entretien des terrasses qui se faisait auparavant. Mais il y a aussi construction de nouvelles voiries pour faciliter l'enclavement, pour désenclaver ces zones-là. Il y a aussi l'intégration de la préservation de la biodiversité. Il y a également le traitement des déchets dans certaines zones qui commencent à apparaître mais également aussi le développement de l'écotourisme comme moyen pour soulager la pression sur les ressources naturelles. Pour conclure et pour ne pas vous retenir longtemps, nous considérons que l'approche SIPAM se trouve au cœur d'un développement durable 
et, euh, je dirais, de l'écosystème. Donc, à un niveau élémentaire, je dirais, les périmètres SIPAM sont euh, développés d'une manière pensée, je veux dire pensée d'une manière à l'échelle de l'écosystème, mais des actions plus concrètes au niveau d'une un, zone circonscrite dans euh, ce qui sont les périmètres. Ces actions, ils s'intègrent avec le... le L'objectif des stratégies territoriales, à savoir par exemple le cas de notre pays, nous avons une stratégie dédiée pour les zones noisiennes et de l'organier qui sont deux écosystèmes très fragiles et donc les SIPAM se constituent un élément qui s'intègre avec cette stratégie territoriale. Cette stratégie territoriale en elle-même, il s'intègre et en harmonie avec une stratégie nationale qui concerne la génération grune ou le plan Maroc vert auparavant, mais aussi nous souhaitons que cette stratégie nationale euh, débouche sur une stratégie internationale que nous avons euh, appelée l'initiative Voyage Durable et que nous avons présentée lors de la COP 22 2016 qui a été organisée pour les changements climatiques en 2016 au Maroc. C'est une euh, initiative qui euh, plaide pour les oasis, mais pour un partage universel et, euh, et des échanges universels. Voilà un petit peu ce que je vous suggère sur les SIPA Maroc d'une manière générale et je suis à votre disposition. Merci. Bon, merci, professeur Bachri. Thank you very much. Again, extremely challenging to, to put a richness of experience into a seven-minute presentation. Uh, so um, much more details will be shared uh, in, as a follow-up. Uh, colleagues, we are running behind. Are you muted, uh, Mr. Kallas? Am I muted? Ah, can you hear me, you colleagues? Did, you did. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Very good. Uh, just to say, grand merci, uh, professeur, and very challenging to fit uh, richness into seven minutes. Uh, more information to be shared uh, in the follow-up. We are challenged by time, colleagues. Um, so we have two more presentations to go. We will travel to Spain and Peru. And I would uh, urge the presenters trying to stay within the seven minutes. And we're currently exploring whether we could extend the webinar for a few more minutes to allow uh, for the discussion session to be, to be conducted in, in a timely manner. So without further ado, let us travel to Spain. It will be presented by Mr. Risadel and Mr. Posé. And uh, they, will, they will both, uh, enlighten us about GS, GS uh, sites, if I, my understanding is around olive trees. And uh, so therefore, I'll give you the floor and the bios of all of our speakers in detail uh, will also be put into the final report so you could have a look at their extensive experience. It would take too long for me with apologies to read all of it out. It's very impressive, but for the sake of time, I will just introduce now Ms. Teresa Adel Pons and Mr. Posé, over to you. All right, we can see the presentation, but no sound. Let us see. Okay, I hopefully it is just me not hearing sound. Sound. There's no sound. No sound. No sound. So. Ahora? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, please. Over to you. Eh, buenos días. Eh, soy Teresa Dell, gerente de la mancomunidad de la Tabla del Senia y responsable del SIPAM Olivos Milenarios del Territorio Senia. El territorio Senia tiene una superficie de 207.000 hectáreas y 112.000 habitantes. Eh, nuestro cultivo mayoritario es el olivo, el olivo de secano, 
en total 33.500 hectáreas de olivar de secano y solo 275 hectáreas de olivar de regadío. En esta zona, en la actualidad, se han inventariado 6.358 olivos milenarios. Son olivos que miden más de 3,5 metros de perímetro de tronco a una altura de 1,30 metro. Tenemos ejemplares incluso de 10 metros, como el que podéis ver en la foto. Este olivo que estáis viendo ahora se denomina la farga del Arión y ha sido datado en más de 1.700 años de antigüedad. Los olivos milenarios de nuestro territorio en las últimas décadas se han visto gravemente amenazados por el espolio. Muchos han sido arrancados y trasladados a otros lugares como elementos decorativos. Nosotros llevamos trabajando en la conservación de estos árboles unos 15 años y durante este tiempo se han, una de las cosas más importantes ha sido las tareas de concienciación de agricultores y de propietarios y también la participación en las leyes de protección. Se está comercializando el aceite de olivos milenarios certificando su origen y su calidad a través de una marca de garantía. También se está iniciando un importante desarrollo del oleoturismo, con visitas guiadas, catas, degustaciones, museos, itinerarios y además contamos con la colaboración de los restaurantes de la zona que se han implicado totalmente con el proyecto. Todo este trabajo se ha visto reconocido y recompensado con diferentes premios como eh, algunos de los que aquí nombramos, el Premio Europa Nostra, el Premio del Paisaje del Consejo de Europa, el reconocimiento SIPAM por parte de la FAO y muchos otros. Tenemos que decir que todo este eh, trabajo se ha logrado con una gestión sostenible de los recursos. Se han mantenido sin transformar las antiguas plantaciones con variedades autóctonas, perfectamente adaptadas a las características de la zona y con densidades de plantación muy bajas, unos 50-70 olivos eh, por hectárea. Estamos hablando de un olivar de secano, lo que, mmm, con lo que no provoca una presión sobre los escasos recursos hídricos y además se siguen utilizando las construcciones de piedra seca que evitan la erosión, mantienen la humedad, evitan las consecuencias de los fuertes vientos, mantienen la biodiversidad y ayudan a luchar contra las plagas. Aquí veis dos fotografías de lo que son las construcciones de piedra seca ligadas al cultivo del olivar. Y además toda la actividad agrícola y ganadera del territorio esenia mantiene un equilibrio y está estrechamente interrelacionada. El cultivo del olivar necesita y a la vez favorece otras actividades, tanto del sector primario como del sector terciario. Se trata de un sistema sostenible tanto a nivel económico como medioambiental. Bueno, por mi parte ya he terminado eh, comentar que Amador Pesé, por problemas de salud, hoy no puede estar con nosotros. Pasaremos un vídeo que nos ha grabado y eh, sí que me gustaría pues, mm, eh, mostraros el olivo de Sinfo, uno de los olivos recuperados por Amador Peset, que es un agricultor dedicado a la recuperación de olivos y que ahora seguidamente os dejo con él. Well, thank you so very much. So here we go. We'll try the video. Over to you. hasta que en 2010 la empresa cerró debido a crisis. Como soy hijo de agricultores, busqué trabajo en el campo, pero desde el primer momento intenté llevar una línea propia. Conociendo el proyecto de los olivos milenarios de la Cámara de Senia, y como las fincas de mis padres solo había 18 olivos milenarios, se me ocurrió buscar fincas abandonadas de olivos milenarios y volverlas a poner en producción. Y entonces firmar contratos con los propietarios. Algunos llevan más de 30 años sin que nadie les hiciera nada. Y después de trabajar eh, duramente y limpiar estas fincas, he conseguido tener una producción total de 157 olivos milenarios, todos ellos en una superficie de 65 hectáreas. Puede haber eh, fincas con una hectárea que solamente tienen pues, un olivo milenario. Y entonces también están rodeadas de unos 5.000 eh, olivos de la variedad tradicional del territorio serio, sobre todo variedad paiva 
y tenemos que pensar entre todo en secano. Todas las fotos que estáis viendo son de la distinta fase de, de, de recuperación. El hecho de recuperar cifras con números milenarios abandonados ha difundido, o han difundido distintos medios de, de comunicación de todo el mundo. Entre ellos, eh, el Dominicado de Figaro en 2016, que nos hizo, nos hizo un reportaje de, de seis páginas. Paralelamente a esta actividad de, de recuperación de los olivos, fui montando una pequeña pasadora de aceite y una tienda para vender el aceite directamente al cliente, al consumidor. Pero vi enseguida que tenía, eh, tenía posibilidad de poder trabajar para más gente, para más pequeños productores. Y entonces eh, monté a ser una instalación de 20 metros cuadrados a un almacén de ya de 100 metros cuadrados y ahora actualmente estoy en un nave de 400 metros cuadrados que dispone de una zona jardinada y una gran sala de cartas desde donde os estoy hablando ahora mismo. ¿vale? Por cierto, esta nave también estaba abandonada en medio del campo, era una fábrica antigua de sillas abandonada que también recuperé y la agregué toda para poder hacer todas estas cosas. Eh, más recientemente dio la conveniencia de empezar otra faceta, el gobierno Y por ello, había comenzado antes del COVID-19 a realizar visitas guiadas a los olivos más monumentales y a explicar todo el proceso de recuperación de estos olivos milenarios. Tras la ruta por dichos olivos, se viene aquí a la sala de catas, ¿vale? donde hacemos una visita completa, con un desayuno, vemos la envasadora y veíamos todo el funcionamiento y todo el proceso que he hecho desde, desde el 2010 hasta el día de hoy. Termino mi intervención con uno de los libros más importantes del mundo, que es el libro de Sinfo, que es el mayor del territorio del Sena. Su perímetro de tronco es de 10-20 a metro de a la altura del suelo. No se ha podido datar porque le falta un trozo, sobre todo le falta la parte del centro, pero en 2019 se le otorgó el premio de Recomer como el mejor olivo monumental del Mediterráneo. Por voluntad de sus propietarios, tengo el honor de encargarme del cuidado y la explotación de este auténtico monumento vivo. Y, claro, como es normal, les invito a todos ustedes a que vengan un día, puedan ver el olivo de Sinfo, puedan visitar la saga de Catas y puedan estar un rato conmigo y entonces comprobar todo el trabajo que estamos realizando aquí en el territorio del Sena. Muchas gracias y, como os he dicho antes, espero verlas. Saludos. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. To both gracias. of you. Uh, and uh, again, we will upload your presentation uh, and also the video, the link to the video of our colleague uh, to the report. Now, without further ado, colleagues, let us travel to Peru, where our colleagues have been up since 6.30 a.m. this morning uh, to join us. And they will tell us about their work around ecosystem restoration and conservation of biodiversity in the Andean wetlands in Peru. So I will invite uh, now Mr. Mr. Javier Laza, uh, Laxa and uh, Mr. Richard Latorre from Peru uh, to, to uh, tell us about their experience. Over to you, colleagues. You're most welcome. Muchas gracias, eh, señor Calas. Muy buenos días a todos los, eh, a los organizadores y a los participantes en el mundo. Bien, voy a hacer la presentación eh, elaborada por Javier Riaxa y Richard de la Torre eh, en torno a algunas de las actividades del proyecto eh, Gestión Sostenible de la Agrobiodiversidad ¿no? y Recuperación de Ecosistemas eh, Vulnerables en Regiones Andinas eh, del Perú. ¿no? Y lo hemos denominado Gestión Intercultural de Ecosistemas Altoandinos. ¿no? Los objetivos del proyecto agrobiodiversidad ¿no? están alineadas con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y del decenio de las Naciones Unidas sobre la restauración de los ecosistemas, ¿no? con un especial énfasis en la seguridad alimentaria, ¿no? en base a la agrobiodiversidad propia de los Andes, ¿no? y que le da justamente la categoría de centro de origen ¿no? de plantas cultivadas. ¿no? También la aplicación, además del enfoque intercultural, ¿no? porque básicamente nuestros socios son comunidades campesinas, quechuas y aymaras, no está el enfoque de género y generacional. Como vemos en las imágenes, la participación de la familia, de los niños, de jóvenes, de mujeres ¿no? y de mayores ¿no? en acciones, por ejemplo, de forestación. El ámbito del proyecto se encuentra ubicado ¿no? en la parte central y sur del Perú, en cinco regiones eh, políticas eh, de nuestro país, ¿no? y con especial énfasis en, este, en las regiones de Cusco y Puno, donde se encuentra la zona Sipam, denominada Corredor 
Cusco Puno, ¿no? Aún este es un aspecto pendiente para el Estado porque la gestión de esta zona CIPAN está aún pendiente, ¿no? A nivel de las diferentes instancias del Estado. ¿no? El, el nombre de corredor justamente se le da porque este, es, esto, estas dos regiones ¿no? constituyen flujos importantes de agrobiodiversidad y de cultura ¿no? entre los pueblos aymaras y los pueblos quechuas del Cusco. ¿no? Eh, justamente entre el límite interregional entre estas dos regiones, Cusco y Puno, ¿no? se encuentra el nudo, ¿no? el nevado del Vilcanota, que justamente desde donde nacen ¿no? los contribuyentes hidrográficos hacia la cuenca del, del Amazonas, hacia la cuenca amazónica, y para el lado sureste hacia la cuenca del lago Titicaca. ¿no? La zona Zipán comprende desde Machu Picchu hasta el lago Titicaca. ¿no? El proyecto es gestionado por el Ministerio del Ambiente, el Ministerio de Agricultura, el GEF, la FAO y Profonam. ¿No? Los ecosistemas eh, actuales y vigentes ¿no? de la región del Cusco básicamente tienen en su gran mayoría, ¿no? en cientos de comunidades campesinas, esta configuración ¿no? de este paisaje donde podemos observar diferentes, ¿no? una diversidad de alturas, ¿no? una diversidad de suelos, una diversidad de ecosistemas y una diversidad y variabilidad de climas, ¿no? En donde justamente estas comunidades ancestralmente han adaptado, ¿no? Una gran eh, variabilidad y diversidad de cultivos, ¿no? Esta, esta diversidad y variabilidad de cultivos justamente tiene correlación con esta diversidad del paisaje. Por eso es que tenemos dificultades cuando pretendemos introducir especies o el mon, especies eh, mejoradas o el monocultivo, ¿no? Constituye la base fundamental para la alimentación de estas comunidades y también de las zonas urbanas de nuestro país. Podemos ver la vigencia, por ejemplo, de sistemas de andenerías y terrazas de formación lenta en plena producción. Las características más bien del altiplano puneño, ¿no? De la región aymara en el Perú tiene estas características, justamente su nombre viene de ahí, ¿no? Altas planicies, ¿no? En la que por su configuración es susceptible, ¿no? De inundaciones. No obstante, también las comunidades durante milenios han implementado respuestas prácticas, no técnicas en torno a esta situación. Por ejemplo, la implementación de camellones o guaruguarus, ¿no? O surcos elevados en donde se produce principalmente eh, tubérculos como la papa, ¿no? Y en las zonas más altas, los granos como la quinoa y la canigua, ¿no? En realidad, el objetivo es fortalecer este enfoque de integralidad, ¿no? Que el, el, el tema de los sistemas de producción, ¿no? Los sistemas agrícolas donde se produce la agrobiodiversidad, ¿no? Esté complementada, ¿no? Todas las comunidades campesinas tienen una división, ¿no? En, en zonas altas, zonas medias y zonas bajas, en donde se desarrollan diferentes características como el hábitat, ¿no? De la fauna silvestre, los parientes silvestres de los cultivos, ¿no? Y la vigencia, como no, de los, eh, de los sistemas de andenerías, ¿no? O terrazas de formación lenta, ¿no? Entonces, esta es una configuración de integralidad, como podemos ver, por ejemplo, en, en esta imagen, donde se combina los agroecosistemas y los ecosistemas, ¿no? En relación a la producción de la seguridad alimentaria, caracterizada por su diversidad, ¿no? Por su diversidad y su gran variabilidad. Las estrategias de intervención en comunidades campesinas, básicamente hemos considerado cuatro, la consulta libre, previa e informada, el enfoque intercultural de género y generacional, ¿no? Y acuerdos con las comunidades, pero un especial énfasis en la gestión de los conocimientos tradicionales y la cosmovisión andina, ¿no? Consideramos que la cosmovisión andina continúa siendo un gran aporte para la humanidad y para el mundo, ¿no? En la forma como nos relacionamos con la naturaleza, ¿no? En donde justamente se puede evidenciar y apreciar, ¿no? Este contraste entre la valoración de recurso o la valoración económica de la naturaleza en contraste con una valoración cultural, ¿no? En torno a la naturaleza, la concepción de un mundo vivo, la concepción ¿no? de, un, de, un, eh, de una equivalencia ¿no? en torno a la naturaleza y el hombre, 
¿no? Eh, en ese sentido, es, las manifestaciones de esta concepción se, se hacen visibles a través de la ritualidad, ¿no? Eh, y la festividad que aún están vigentes, ¿no? En, 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 en la actualidad, ¿no? Eh, además, porque los conocimientos tradicionales se desarrollan, ¿no? En relación con la cosmovisión andina, ¿no? En, la, en, en, en el contexto, ¿no? De la concepción de un mundo vivo, los conocimientos tradicionales también se desarrollan en ese sentido, ¿no? En, entonces, este es un aspecto muy importante a considerar. Otros, eh, los lineamientos para el, para el tema de la restauración, tanto de la agrobiodiversidad como de los ecosistemas, están eh, eh, sustentados básicamente en la planificación participativa con las comunidades, es decir, políticas de abajo hacia arriba, ¿no? Justamente como una respuesta a esta aplicación de diferentes enfoques, metodologías, ¿no? Eh, instrumentos de gestión que se desarrollan desde, eh, desde otras instancias, ¿no? Desde, desde las oficinas y desde los escritorios, ¿no? En este caso, este es un aspecto importante a, a contemplar, ¿no? También la complementariedad intercultural en la gestión del territorio, esta complementariedad entre los conocimientos tradicionales y los conocimientos científicos, ¿no? El fortalecimiento del enfoque de género y generacional en la gestión y, cómo no, las sinergias, ¿no? Con las instituciones, eh, universidades, ¿no? Gobiernos locales para que esto se traduzca en políticas, ¿no? En instrumentos de gestión y también en mecanismos de retribuciones por conservación de los servicios ecosistémicos y de la agrobiodiversidad, ¿no? En torno a la planificación participativa, esta es la síntesis de cómo eh, in, se implementan las acciones de restauración, una planificación e ident identificación por parte de las comunidades campesinas, la elaboración de sus mapas parlantes, la identificación de las zonas importantes, en este caso las zonas degradadas, ¿no? Y de, para luego implementar las acciones de restauración, en este caso forestación. No obstante, sobre la base del fortalecimiento de la gobernanza comunal, ¿no? Se implementan forestación con, con especies nativas, revegetación con pastos nativos, zanjas de infiltración, también acciones de siembra y cosecha de agua de lluvia, todo ello complementado ¿no? con la gestión de la agrobiodiversidad ¿no? en el Perú. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And I'm wondering whether we are also going to hear from our other colleague. All clear. Okay. Thank you. So colleagues, um, this brings us to our, our third session, uh, which we are running a little bit late and we are asking for a 15 minute extension uh, to, to allow for a, for a interactive discussion right now with the panelists. So with your permission, we will extend we will extend the seminar uh, and close just before three o'clock uh, Rome time. So 15 to 20 minutes maximum extension with, uh, with our apologies. So the third session is really about zooming in and diving deeper into two critical areas we've been trying to discuss. Number one, the linkages between uh, the GIAS practices and ecosystem restoration to understand a bit more. And secondly, concrete linkages or potential linkages to the UN decade on ecosystem restoration as such. And if you recall, the UN decade is very ambitious. It's about restoring, revitalizing. It's about preventing, but it's also about sustaining these practices and scaling those practices. And it won't stop in 2030. It will, it will in fact be an effort to continue well beyond 2030. So with, with that in mind, how can we also think of scale in terms of moving from several pockets of excellence and uh, hope into a larger sea of transformational scale uh, to reach the agreed goals of the decade? So the way we would like to structure it is that in order of um, 
presentations. I will ask two questions uh, to each of the panelists and they will have three minutes each to respond. So this is a challenge. I will ask everybody uh, of the panelists to prioritize and just give us the two to three key points for to each question. And I'll invite the, uh, pa the participants uh, to also give ideas on each of those questions into the question and answer uh, area. Now, once again, we will not have time, unfortunately, to answer all of the questions in the question and answer, but we will collect those. And my understanding is that the secretariat and panelists will make an effort to answer those questions in writing, uh, potentially as part of the final report. That's my suggestion. So if that's agreeable with everybody, let's go to the questions um, uh, number, the, the, no, the two questions. The first question is, um, what are the two to three key effective approaches and practices for ecosystem restoration in the GIA sites in your countries? And I will start in, in order of presentation with Dr. Naito. And the second question will be, um, what are two to three potential ideas uh, or experiences, how GS can contribute to the UN decade of ecosystem restoration itself. So I hope those two questions are clear and we will go uh, in order of presentation. First, we will travel to Japan. Dr. Naito, give us your, yeah. your, your key thoughts, please, in three minutes to both of these questions. Over to you, please. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. First, I would like to emphasize the importance of second nature, such as semi-natural grassland in Japan. This kind of ecosystem is not purely natural, but species rich. In fact, uh, through the experience of researching vegetation diversity in two just sites of Japan, semi-natural grasslands have a greater number of plant species. We should focus on the potential of human nature hybrid ecosystem. Second, I also would like to mention that biodiversity crisis results not only from environmental overuse, but also from underuse. In 1880s, 80% 80 of our land was grassland, but currently uh, only 1% of our land. This brings extinction crisis of grassland, uh, grassland wildlife, and also human custom and value system. So, the answer to question one is that we better focus on the importance and potential of second nature and try to maintain or restore such kind of ecosystems. They are not pure nature, but rich in biodiversity compared with natural ecosystems sometimes. I assume that many GS sites in Japan and world have some kind of second nature in the system. We better aware of that and exchange the practice and idea to maintain or resource second nature. Japan has a lot of second nature, such as Satoyama and semi grassland. Local people of our just site try to restore second nature voluntarily, and local government and private companies assist their effort. For example, people of Tokushima Mountain site reclaim abandoned farmland by themselves. We would like to share this kind of experience. Uh, with you. The answer to question two is that the ecosystem in related with GS site have been used for food production up to now, but uh, most of them uh, are in crisis somehow. Uh, one strong cause which brings crisis of GS site is misconnection between indigenous food production system and contemporary food supply system. We should try to articulate two systems and uh, make just function continuously. Because many just sites contain second nature, we cannot restore just related ecosystem without human activities. So I believe we uh, go beyond human nature dichotomy and try to restore second nature by using just program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Naito, and uh, well noted, and we'll make sure that these uh, suggestions are also reflected in the report. So anything you can share with us on that would be welcome. Uh, straight to China, then, if I may, 
uh, to to Dr. Mocheng. Mo Dr. Mocheng, in, in, in three minutes, uh, what what do you leave us with uh, to um, with regards to the two questions? Over to you, uh, Professor. Okay, <laughs> I would like to the question too. Uh, from the perspective of ecology, ecosystem restoration is an important block. Scientists have proposed many effective ecological restoration measures and approaches for different ecosystems, including biological, engineering, policy measures, and so on. In fact, many measures and technologies have also borrowed from traditional wisdom. In GS sites, local residents have also created many effective technologies and methods in their long-term products and protect practices, which can provide a reference for ecosystem restoration in different regions. For example, the potential GS in China, the Ahokin nomadic system, since the 1980s in order to improve the quality of life, heard in many grassland areas in China have successively abandoned the nomadic methods and changed to set stalking. Set stalking is continuous grazing in which a certain number of livestock stay in a certain range of grassland without restriction. However, if they are fixed on a pasture for a long time, the pasture was destroyed and the ecosystem degraded. So in order to solve this problem, starting from the 2010s, degraded grassland was circled and the grazing was prohibited. However, after grazing prohibition for five to six years, we found that the pastures in no grazing areas has not been well restored. More steel grasses was produced and they caused other ecological problems, such as affecting the growth of tender grasses, reducing biodiversity and easily causing fires. But in the area where the Ahokin nomadic system is located, this problem doesn't occur because appropriate intervention is beneficial, beneficial to the health of the ecosystem that if we can explore the wisdom or traditional nomadic system earlier, we can make a contribution to the restoration of China's grasslands. Therefore, I think for ecosystem restoration, new technologies are very important. And the traditional wisdom is also very important. The effective ecosystem restore, restoration measures should be the integration of traditional wisdom and the modern technology. And the key is to found the traditional wisdom of jazz by scientific analysis and introduce the modern technology and de uh, disseminate such good restoration protections to uh, other agriculture areas. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Musheng. And again, also your, your thoughts, these and any other written, written suggestions you may wish to provide will be incorporated into the final report. With that, we will travel again to Tanzania to Mr. Banzi to, to give us his insights on the two questions. Also in three minutes, please, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, you, you are on mute, uh, Mr. Bunzi, so kindly unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Over to uh, you. I, the first one is on the effective practices um, among this, what I have presented. The way I see comp uh, in comparison to the, in relation to the landscape, I can say that the integration of these practices has really made it uh, resilient because you see, it is a very steep uh, foot slopes of the mountains. So these practices, uh, agroforest itself and the associated practices in an integrated manner has given the result of this uh, present uh, situation and 
supporting uh, the, uh, the needs for over those years. Uh, you can say that nutrient cycling can be one of the key area because uh, in the integration, you see that they are using crop residues, feeding to livestock, and then it take the manure back to the field. In that way, it makes the system stable and uh, kind of supporting itself. On the other uh, second question on what uh, can be taken to the NDKD, what I can say that uh, agroforest, for instance, in our case, this is just one part, but it is spread all around the country. And I see that in terms of ecosystem uh, conservation and restoration, agroforestry plays a very uh, uh, key uh, contribution. So probably uh, the continuous support and dissemination of these uh, lessons to other areas could be uh, a very important uh, issue to be taken over for the decade. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bunzi. Again, challenging to, to wrap it all in three minutes. Thank you. And with that, um, uh, Professor Bahri to Morocco in three minutes. What are your key key takeaway uh, points to two questions? Over to you, Monsieur. Merci beaucoup. Uh, comme approche de préservation des écosystèmes, pour moi, Il n'y a pas 36 000 solutions. C'est prendre en considération l'homme qui vit dans ces écosystèmes. Et à travers l'homme qui vit ce, 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 dans ces écosystèmes, je propose trois axes. Il y a répondre aux besoins essentiels de cet homme qui vit dans ces écosystèmes, les besoins de base dont il a besoin, pour réconcilier, pour le réconcilier avec son milieu, c'est-à-dire tout ce dont les besoins nécessaires de santé, d'éducation, d'infrastructures de base et ainsi de suite, mais aussi innover dans le sens de valoriser les produits de ces écosystèmes. C'est le meilleur moyen pour soulager la pression, pour soulager la pression sur les ressources naturelles et créer un lien vital entre l'homme et la nature. En valorisant le produit agricole de grande valeur dans ces écosystèmes, en valorisant l'artisanat dans ces, ces zones, en, valor, en valorisant le tourisme dans ces écosystèmes, ils permettent à ces gens-là d'avoir un bien. Et par ce, ce moyen-là, ce bien, c'est la nature pour eux. Troisième aspect, c'est d'aider ces gens à faire face aux, aux, aux intempéries, aux changements climatiques, aux problèmes des risques naturels. Et c'est là où il y a le travail aussi de l'intervention de nous tous pour créer une certaine résilience, parce que souvent ces gens-là sont assujettis à des problèmes liés aux changements climatiques, en l'occurrence des intempéries, en l'occurrence des raretés de l'eau, en l'occurrence également des pertes de leur sol. Et donc là, l'État, la, 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 la communauté internationale pourra être euh, à, à l'aide de, ce, de cette population et de ce système. Trois points. Pour répondre aux deuxièmes questions, qu'est-ce que peut apporter les CIPAM dans le cadre de la préservation et la restauration des écosystèmes, moi, pour moi, la réponse, elle est tr très simple. C'est d'aider à la mise en œuvre des plans d'action. Aider à la mise en œuvre des plans d'action. Chaque CIPAM dispose d'un plan d'action très riche, très complet. Et il est là. Parfois, il n'est pas facile à le mettre en place. Il y a des contraintes locales. Et donc, les CIPAM pourraient être à l'aide pour continuer, pour préserver, pour assurer 
La pérennité de ces CIPAM, c'est de les soutenir par des plans d'action sur le terrain et concrets. Voilà ce que j'ai à dire. J'ai une petite remarque. J'ai reçu quelques questions. Je demande aux collègues organisateurs s'ils peuvent me transférer ces questions pour que je puisse les répondre. Compte, compte tenu du temps, je ne peux pas répondre à toutes les questions qui concernent les pratiques tra traditionnelles dans les, dans les CIPAM, concernant les semences dans les CIPAM, concernant l'écotourisme dans les CIPAM. Et merci beaucoup pour euh, ce webinaire. Merci à tout le monde. Merci, professeur. Thank you very much. Well noted that the questions will be also transferred to you for further reflection. And with that, we're going to move to Spain and then Peru for our final two speakers to intervene. Ms. Adele Pons, what are your, your key, key thoughts on the two questions, please? Over to you. Eh, bueno, eh, contestando las preguntas desde nuestro SIPAM, consideramos muy importante, el, en nuestro caso, el tema de la recuperación de las fincas abandonadas. Consideramos que eh, conservar estos árboles que hace más de mil años que están plantados es muy, una opción mucho mejor que eh, la transformación de fincas para plantar nuevas variedades que además no estarán tan adaptadas a nuestra zona y que seguro tendrán eh, más problemas de, para, para el cultivo. De esta manera lo que estamos haciendo es preservar la biodiversidad y estas variedades tradicionales que en muchos casos se están perdiendo. También la importancia de eh, los cultivos del secano, sobre todo en nuestra zona, en, una, en el Mediterráneo, que tenemos problemas siempre de, de agua con escaseces de agua. Mantener estos cultivos de secano que no provocan una presión sobre los recursos escasos hídricos eh, nos parece muy acertado y es una manera de, de, de resiliencia que, que hace que, bueno, pues que, que estos cultivos eh, sean sostenibles tanto medioambientalmente como también económicamente. Eh, por último, también comentar el tema de la restauración del entorno a través de la piedra seca. Es un material muy cercano, es un material de kilómetro cero eh, que hace que tengamos un paisaje eh, que sea una simbiosis total entre lo que sería el hombre y la naturaleza y eso hace que bueno, tengamos unos, unos paisajes muy bellos y que sean sostenibles económicamente y también medioambientalmente. Y cómo no, eso provoca que turísticamente eh, seamos un atractivo, ¿no? porque en, mm, tenemos que pensar transversalmente, no solo como productores de, de aceite de oliva, sino todo lo que supone eh, un proyecto de estas características, pues eh, al sector primario, desde el aceite, pero también eh, en el turismo, también en el comercio. En definitiva, lo que se trata es de que sirva para el desarrollo integral de, de una zona. Y ya por último, yo pienso que las zonas IPAM tenemos una función muy importante de, eh, de dar ejemplo a otros lugares que puedan tener similitudes a nuestro territorio y que puedan, eh, podemos servir de ejemplo para eh, futuras actuaciones. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Madame. And we move now, last but not least, to Peru with our last intervention uh, to the two questions. Uh, Mr. Lassa, your, uh, the floor is yours, please. Muchas gracias. ¿no? En relación a las, eh, a las preguntas, eh, es necesario, justamente la, la exposición tenía eh, como eje principal el tema de la, del enfoque intercultural. ¿no? Es necesario poner en contexto la vigencia ¿no? de estos pueblos originarios en el Perú. ¿no? Constituyen alrededor de más del 10% de la población del Perú. ¿no? Son 3 millones de habitantes que habitan ¿no? aproximadamente en 9.000 comunidades campesinas y nativas ¿no? en la Amazonía y en los Andes. ¿no? Estas comunidades son poseedores de conocimientos milenarios. ¿no? En, en buena cuenta, la agrobiodiversidad se encuentra ¿no? en gestionada por estas comunidades. Asimismo, servicios ecosistémicos, los bosques nativos, los humedales, los pastizales se encuentran en, la, en, el, en, el, en el ámbito de estas comunidades campesinas y nativas. En ese sentido, amerita y nos propone el escenario una gestión intercultural, ¿no? <ríe> tomando en cuenta en principio estos conocimientos milenarios ¿no? y también el tema de la cosmovisión andina, como había 
eh, como había eh, indicado al inicio, ¿no? El, la zona CITAN, o sea, que es aún un tema pendiente en el Perú, por lo menos la existencia de este corredor eh, Cusco-Puno como zona CIPAN, es aún un tema pendiente para el Estado, ¿no? Para, el para los gobiernos locales, para los gobiernos regionales, ¿no? Para los ministerios y el Estado en sí, ¿no? En realidad constituye un gran potencial de protección, en principio, de la agrobiodiversidad. En, en, en nuestro país, ¿no? Que obviamente aporta al mundo, ¿no? Con, con, con los recursos genéticos, ¿no? En, este, en, en ese sentido. Son una instancia de protección, pero no protección solamente, ¿no? De los recursos genéticos, sino todo el contexto, ¿no? Que, que promueve esta conservación, es decir, todo el contexto cultural, ¿no? Que, que, que hace posible, ¿no? La vigencia de la agrobiodiversidad. En el, eh, es necesario, o sea, indicar que toda la agrobiodiversidad en el Perú, en un 90% y más, ¿no? Se desarrolla en condiciones de secano, ¿no? En condiciones de secano, es decir, en conversación permanente con el clima. Por tanto, hay todavía una vigencia, ¿no? Actual de estos conocimientos tradicionales en relación con el clima. Cada año agrícola, ¿no? Cada año agrícola en los Andes es diferente, ¿no? Por tanto, los agricultores de estas comunidades implementan diferentes estrategias para hacer frente, ¿no? Estos aspectos pueden ser tomados en cuenta como políticas locales, ¿no? De apoyo, porque las respuestas están ahí en las comunidades campesinas y es más, la gestión de gobierno local, regional y nacional debe tomar en cuenta estos aspectos, como digo, orientado hacia una gestión intercultural de la agrobiodiversidad y de los ecosistemas. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. So before giving over to the former closing, um, I have three points that I would like to leave you with. Number one, I want to thank all the panelists and uh, the participants, all of you, and the organizers uh, who have scripted this uh, out to the detail with lots of work. So thank you very much for that. Secondly, our objectives were learning and synergies. And I do think that we've achieved some learning, also diving into evidence, evidence that there is great potential in the GIA sites to make a tangible contributions and concrete synergies with the UN decade on ecosystem restoration itself. Thirdly, making peace with nature. Making peace with nature was mentioned as one of the key mottos. And I do think that um, we have a chance through the GIAs to make a tangible contribution to this objective and as you see behind me over here to uh, become the generation restoration that our colleague from UN uh, Tim has um, uh, advocated for without so with that uh, just the beginning of the process I will now give the the floor to Miss Mette Wilke she's the director of the forestry division here at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And she's a key visionary and champion and internal driving force uh, to, to lead FAO in this effort uh, to make the most uh, contribution it can. So, uh, uh, Ms. Wilkie, thank you for your patience and over to you for the closing words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. And let me just add the thanks to all of those presenters that have been here today and to the participants for the many questions and comments I can see in the chat and the Q&A. It's been a fantastic event here and it really has highlighted how these globally important agricultural heritage systems can contribute to the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, but not just synergy with that decade. I think what we can see here is this is a great way of creating synergies between two UN decades, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration and the UN decade on family farming. We've heard many presentations here today and we've heard how restoration of the health and productivity of agricultural and food systems can help us conserve biodiversity and enhance their habitats. It can help us mitigate and adapt to climate change for farmers and local communities. It can enhance food security and it can create jobs and livelihoods. 
That is exactly the recipe that we need now to build back better after the COVID-19 pandemic. So I would encourage you to make sure that those messages are put forward to those who are making decisions now on how to invest to restart the economy. We do need to rebuild better, rebuild and, and build back better. And these systems that are already in place is a great place to start. And very, very importantly, because they're telling us one more thing, it's not just about biodiversity, climate change, the economics and food security. It's also about culture. It's about our heritage. And that is crucially important that we keep that in mind as well. So I really want to encourage you all to share your good stories, your lessons learned, your experiences, your best practices with both of the two decades. Send it into the websites for the two decades. Send them to me or some of the organizers here today. We'll help share that. Particularly, we're looking for best practices and guidance in different languages as well, and for different types of ecosystems in different contexts. So if you can help us with that, that would be fantastic. We can then help spread that even further that we can do in a, in a webinar, although we have close to 200 people here. But we can do more than that. And please use the visual identity tools and whatever else we have of material on the UN Decade website uh, and use the hashtag Generation Restoration. I hope you will all make sure that these next 10 years, you will be part of it. You will take this as your decade and that you will help make sure that we look at how we can help restore the health and productivity of agricultural systems as a great contribution to restoring nature, restoring ecosystems, restoring hope, and as Patrick said, has had peace with nature. So thank you so much, everybody, for today. It has been fantastic. Let's keep this network and the sharing of information going, uh, and let's see how you can help take this decade or these two decades forwards within your existing networks already. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Miss Wilkie. All right. Bye-bye, everybody, and thank you so very much. Grand merci.